Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I just want to have a little show of hands of how many of you still, and it's okay, you don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed or shy whether you did this or not, but how many of you made, whether it was a formal or informal resolution for the New Year's coming, 2019? Let's see a few hands. I'd have to raise my hand. It's kind of a resolution. It's a... Uh, yeah, you don't have to raise your hand for this part um, because it's the 13th, and the question is, um, how you doing? The, the, uh, the problem um, that we have with uh, resolving to stop something or start something is what we all know absolutely clearly, right? That, that at times, we, um, we might resolve to make a change in our life and uh, maybe our health, eating habits, exercise, whatever it might be. But the problem when we resolve to, to do that, sometimes we fall into this trap, kind of an all or nothing kind of trap, that says, okay, well, if you stumbled once, well, maybe 2020. Um, and, and you just kind of go back to your normal patterns, right? That, that is kind of the challenge that, that most of us struggle with, an all or nothing kind of thinking with resolutions. And so if we break one, um, then we just kind of go back to our normal patterns again and, and, and plan to start over later. Um, now, uh, you don't have to raise your hand for this, because um, I just kind of play with words a little bit, because I often would say that I don't make resolutions, but I make goals, um, like it's different. And in some ways, it probably is different, and maybe you've thought the same thing. Maybe you would raise your hand to say that you've made some goals for the year to come. Uh, not that you're necessarily starting something or stopping something, but that you set out a goal for what the end of the year might look like, because, and this is kind of how goals work, typically in my life, is that it's not all or nothing. If I fail this week or this month, well, that goal is still sitting out there and I still might accomplish it. So it's this uh, step-by-step process of trying to get to that goal. A problem in my life and maybe yours too, is that sometimes that goal is so big and it's so awesome, it's so great, that we end up thinking that maybe it's just not even possible. And, and so we kind of give up as well. Well, I'll never accomplish it. I'll never actually fulfill it. I'll never actually do it. So might as well just kind of check out maybe 2020, may, maybe next time. Uh, whether it's, whether it's um, resolutions or goals, we sometimes struggle with those, right? We struggle with them because uh, we, well, our lives don't always look perfect and our goals don't always look that, that attainable. And so sometimes we give up. Let me... Um, just have you think about that for a second, because we're going to apply that to how that might look in our lives of faith. Uh, what does it look like in our lives of faith to uh, resolve to start something or to resolve to stop something? Or what does it look like in our Christian lives where we have this end goal in mind, a goal of how we might live or how we might speak or how we might act or what we might start or stop? Um, resolutions and, and goals do apply to our Christian lives as well. Uh, before we look at the text, though, let me remind you of something that you already know, something that we speak about fairly often, and, um, and it's, it's really the end goal or the resolutions in the life of Christ and in your life as well. Because here's the bottom line, this, and this is maybe pointed, maybe it's difficult, but the truth is that Jesus lived in order to die. That's, that's what he came for. It was what he resolved to do. It was the end goal. Right? When Jesus was born, when he came, um, when we see him being baptized, even today in this text, we're reminded of his baptism, and his baptism wasn't to wash away sins, but it was to step into our life. It was to be uh, in our shoes. It was to live the life that we would live or strive to live, all the way knowing that he resolved to take away the sins of the world. That's why he was born. He, he was born in order to die. That was, that was the goal. That was the process. And, and all, all the while, even before the creation of the world, all the while, even while we're reading about his life, even all the while, while he's living this perfect life, the, the goal, the plan, even from the Old Testament times, the Messiah would come to take away the sins of the world. And so, indeed, Jesus lived in order to die. Now, the other part of it is our end goal 
our resolving, our resolution, our, our, our end is, is just the opposite. And again, this sounds pointed and difficult and maybe even harsh, but, but God designed us that we would die in order to live. And, and oftentimes we think about it this way. We say, okay, well, we're going to die at some point. These fragile, sinful human bodies are going to die, and then we will live with him in eternity forever. But, but also, God actually gives us this opportunity, even in his word today, our reading today, is that we would die in order to live even today. That we would die to sin in order to live a new life through the waters of baptism. So, so it's not this end goal that someday, someday I will die and I'll be with Jesus forever. No, God also gives us this opportunity that even today, that we would die to sin, die to the power of sin, and that we would live a new life today. That today, when you come and you hear the word of God and that, that Jesus interacts with you, uh, even years ago when you were baptized and Jesus interacted with you, that you died to sin and that today and that day, your life would be changed, that you would live a new life, that you would die in order to live. It's a, it's a crazy, awesome, incredible concept that our reading has for us today, but it's one that's also incredibly practical for Christians like us even today. Here's the, the reading that we have. It's from Romans and the challenge that uh, the people of God were having is a similar challenge that maybe even we have today. Um, because we do this. Um, we might, uh, like we said with the resolutions or the goals, um, this is what we often do in regards to them. Let, let me just be specific about our Christian resolutions, our Christian goals, is that sometimes we would minimize minimize the impact of our sin or minimize the impact or the power of our baptism. Uh, let, let me just remind you um, what that might look like in practical terms. Um, so, because we run upon some difficult things, because we might resolve to make a change or, or um, resolve to start or stop something, and, and we see that we've done it again, what we often do is that we surround ourselves with others <laughs> that would also struggle with similar things. Uh, maybe we surround ourselves with those that would, oh, comfort us even in our sin. We would surround ourselves with others that would say, yes, we're all miserable sinners, and so we are destined to live a life that is that. So don't feel too bad. Right? We uh, surround ourselves, if we struggle with lying, we surround ourselves with liars in that, that way, that it, it helps. Right? It, it minimizes the impact and the danger of sin. Or if we struggle with gossip, well then a couple of our friends also gossip too, and so we can minimize the impact of that sin. Or, or we struggle with pornography, and we surround ourselves with others that would struggle with the same kind of difficulty, and, and everybody sits around and says, yeah, it's a difficulty, and it's the way we are, it's who we are, we're sinful, we're going to fall and struggle in that. And so we, we can minimize the impact or the struggle of that sin. Name it. Whatever sin or whatever struggle, we would say that often, too often, we would surround ourselves with others or we would speak in our own minds to minimize the, the danger of sin. And thereby, when we minimize the danger of sin, well, it's just not that bad. Or we, and this is us, right, even in this room today, uh, we minimize the impact of our baptism. And practically speaking, it would be that we would, um, well, we'd know that we're baptized, but we would fail to be reminded of the change that took place in our baptism. We would begin to minimize it, even with others around us, to say, um, yes, it happened, but it happened, and I don't even remember it, as Miranda said, and, and I don't know that it was that big a deal. We don't speak those words outright, but we kind of feel that way because nothing really happened. Right? Our life wasn't immediately transformed, so we think. We, we still kind of lived whatever way that we were uh, going to live. There wasn't some uh, line drawn in our lives. Then we're suddenly transformed, and people could see us on the street and go, oh, yeah, you're different. You look different because you're baptized. And so we minimize the power, the impact of baptism. And, and, and either way, whether it's minimizing the impact of sin 
or minimizing the power of baptism, it leads us to this one, this one response. I guess I'll just live the way I live. And when I die, eventually, then I'll be made perfect and I'll be with Jesus forever. This is precisely the challenge that the Christians, people of God in Rome, were dealing with so many years before. And, and, and we can see it happening in their response. It, it says this, and, and, and hear, hear what's happening. They're minimizing the impact of their sin, no doubt, and, and they're minimizing the, the significance of their baptism, no doubt, because that's what the Word of God actually corrects them towards. Here's their response. Well then, should we just keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Don't you love the way they churched it up so nice? Right? So, so we, can, we can just go on sinning because that's a good thing. God would actually display his, more of his grace uh, so that people could actually see how God forgives terrible sinners like, like me. So should we just go on living the way we're going to live? Should we just fall away from those resolutions or those goals or those plans that God has for us? And I would imagine that you and I would fall into that same kind of trap. Should we just give up? Because that's the way we are. Should, should we just give up because, we, well, we stumbled again, so we might as well just minimize the sin that we struggle with and, and, and wait till that last day comes? Well, then, should we just keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his grace? Um, here's the response. Hear it clearly. Here's God's word proclaimed to the people of Rome and also proclaimed to you. Absolutely not. And I would imagine that, uh, that Paul or others that would read Paul's words that God gave him um, might even shout those words. But absolutely not. Absolutely not. You don't just, just minimize your sin. Absolutely not. You don't just minimize the impact of your baptism. Absolutely not. Instead, he says this, since we've died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, you joined him in his death, for we died and were buried with Christ. You died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power, power of the Father, now you, we, also may live new lives. This is the most amazing news ever. Your baptism was significant. First of all, your sin was significant. Your sin would separate you from God forever. We can't minimize our sin. Uh, we know, we speak it, we are reminded of it in God's word constantly. That your sin, the very sin that you would be thinking about, even as I'm preaching to you today, that lying, that gossip, that, that struggle with, with uh, addiction, that struggle with pornography, that, that struggle and difficulty that you have with, with uh, relationships or unwilling to forgive those others, your sin would separate you from God forever. We can't minimize the impact of sin, but we also can't minimize the impact of baptism. Um, I want you to raise your hand again, not whether you've made goals or resolutions, but raise your hand again if you have been baptized. And, and um, it, you can put your hands down, awesome. If you didn't raise your hand, this text today is an absolute invitation. It's an absolute invitation to be joined with Jesus in baptism. It's also, if you did raise your hand, it's an absolute clear reminder of your new identity in Christ. Right, that every single one of you that raised your hand, and I would raise my hand too, uh, that we have been transformed and changed. We have been, either at this font or another, through water and the word of God, you have been joined with Jesus Christ. And because you've been joined with Jesus Christ, you died. Right? You died uh, in, in his death. You were joined to his death. And, and that you sa it says here that you are no longer a slave to sin. You have died to sin. And, and so think about it this way. That the sin, whatever is going through your mind, it does not own you. It does not define you. Maybe you would struggle with, with, with lying, but you're not a liar. Right? Maybe you would struggle with gossip, but you're not a gossip. Maybe you would struggle with addiction, but you're not an addict. 
Maybe you would struggle with, uh, um, with, with, uh, with any variety of sin. But those sins don't define you. What defines you is that you've been joined to Jesus Christ. And that that sin does not own you. Not anymore. That sin doesn't uh, control you. Not anymore. That, 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 that sin uh, is not your master. Not anymore. That instead, because you've been joined to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God guides you to live a new life. This, um, this doesn't take away the fact that we might make a resolution for some change that might happen in our life. It doesn't take away the fact that we might make some goal. But it absolutely does change whether we just chuck the whole thing. Right? It absolutely does change the fact that we wouldn't just minimize our sin. It absolutely changes the fact that we would minimize our baptism because you belong to Jesus Christ. And so whether you step forward tomorrow and you fulfill that uh, resolution one more day or you step forward tomorrow and you keep that goal in mind of what God wants you to be and do or, or you step forward tomorrow and you fail to keep that resolution or you step forward tomorrow and you, you begin to get disappointed with that goal that's set out Here's the end goal. The end goal is not just that you would die someday and be joined to God forever in eternity. The end goal that God has for you is that today, tomorrow, you would live a new life. And when you fail, you see the struggle of sin, and you come to him in true repentance, and he offers you forgiveness of sins and says, but you are mine. You belong to me. You've died to the power of sin. Go again and live a new life. Or you have a day that's pretty successful, it seems, and, and you, you live that new life, and we come to him in ongoing life of repentance, and he says, you know what? I'm going to forgive you for what is going to happen yesterday or even tomorrow because you live in this state of grace. Now go and live a new life. That's the text. That's the word of God for you today. You have been baptized into Christ Jesus. And because you've been baptized into Christ Jesus, you have died to sin. So why would you live in it any longer? Instead, go by the power of the Holy Spirit and live a new life. May that be true for each and every one of us. Amen. It's great to worship with you again today. We continue our worship this morning as we uh, gather, give our tithes and offerings to the Lord that his work would continue to even thrive here in this place. Amen.